In other words, Damascus is the oldest continuing city in the world. Now, there have been times that there have been people that have fought there and fought around it and in it, but we did some research and found out that according to most scholars, Damascus has never been totally annihilated the way that prophecy predicts. Listen to another prophecy, Jeremiah in chapter 49. And fire shall destroy the walls of Damascus. Amos chapter 1 verse 5. And fire shall burn the palaces of Damascus and the people of Syria will flee into captivity. Again, that's Amos chapter 1 and verse 5. Now what's interesting is if you go to Amos 1, it mentions that, now this is interesting, especially in the setting of where things are today in the nation of Israel prophetically. It mentions that both Damascus and Gaza are going to be destroyed and Lebanon will be affected in the process. Now let me stop, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta get this to you. It says that there's three places, Damascus, Gaza, and Lebanon. Now why are those three places important? Because again, in the area of Damascus, it has thousands and thousands of terrorists. So that makes sense about its destruction because these would be individuals if they could get chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, they would use them against the Jewish people. Why would Gaza be mentioned? How odd that Hamas controls Gaza and constantly is trying to send missiles into Israel from Gaza. Why would Lebanon be affected in this prophecy? Because Hezbollah, hello, is in Lebanon. So in other words, you've got the three areas. You've got Syria, you've got Gaza and Lebanon that that are mentioned in the prophecies and in these particular predictions we see that today involving modern Israel these three areas have numerous individuals who would want death to Israel or death to the Jewish people. How would anyone have known that except the Lord inspiring a prophet to write that centuries ago? Now let me go a little further and talk to you now about not just Damascus and its desolation in biblical prophecy but another country that is going to have severe difficulties in the future will be prophetically the country of Persia. Now Persia as most most of you know, I've shared this with you before on Manifest, Persia is a name which is given to what is today the area of Iran, the country of Iran. And uh, let me just read to you Ezekiel 38, 4 and 5, the, and I will turn you back, put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya all of them with shields and with helmet. Now, this is interesting because, and I want to make this statement, I'm going to keep sharing this with you, and of course, by the time that you watch this program, something may have already happened. But it's pretty evident that eventually there will be a pre-war with Israel and the Iranians. And this may be what happens, that Iran, after this war, will try to rebuild and retaliate later in the future against Israel by forming a coalition of Islamic nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 to attack Israel. Now the point that I want to make is this, in the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 where Persia is involved, you will discover that the Bible says that five-sixths of them are destroyed. In other words, one-sixth of the army remains. It says that God sends a fire on them and also sends an earthquake. Now, I'm not trying to spook anybody here, but we're on a major earthquake fault line right here. And so this is where the scripture teaches in Ezekiel 38 and 39 it's going to take place. Then we see that there are earthquake fault lines in this area. And then the Bible talks about how for seven months they're going to have to bury the skeletons. They're going to wait seven months and they're going to put sticks up all over the ground where bodies are. And then for seven years they're going to burn the weapons. So here's my point. Now you've got to, you've got to catch this. You've got to grasp this in your mind and grasp this in your spirit and here's what it is that when Damascus is destroyed when Damascus is wiped out according to the biblical prophecy that leaves a void with Syria then when Persia enters this battle with Israel and it's real interesting that you have uh, can I say this to you Syria is mentioned is not mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39 what's happened to it there's been a war before Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's not mentioned. The Assyrians are mentioned all through the Bible as warring with Israel. But in Ezekiel 38 and 39, it's not the Syrians, it's Persia. Why? 
Because once Assyria has experienced its destruction, then the power, according to biblical prophecy, would then come over to Iran or the Persians. Then the Persians make their move against Israel in a major conflict involving all these Islamic nations. But Israel will have weapons or some type of capability. Of course, I talked to one man in the military. He says, well, I believe if you look at Scripture, it's just supernatural. It's God Himself that does certain things that defeats this army. And so then if when the Persians are defeated, look at a map. Let's show them a map right now, Mr. Producer. Put this up. You see, you see, you see Lebanon is affected. You see Syria is affected. You see the Persians or Iran is affected. What country is left that becomes the main power of the Middle East? Tell me. It's Iraq. Iraq is the one that's left. Iraq is not involved in either of those battles. And the reason I believe it's not involved is simply because it has more of a democratic type of government, at least attempting to have that form of government. But here's the second reason. When you have the destruction, for example, of the uh, Damascus in Syria or the destruction of the Persians and you put them together, it makes the country of Iraq the leading country. Why is that important? Now, for those of you who are here and at home, who have our new book, Unleashing the Beast, that's just been written. You know we talk about this, and here's the key, because it is believed by Islam that the Mahdi will come at the end of days, and some teach that he will pray at a mosque in Damascus, Syria, in that area, but others believe, especially those from the Shia branch of Islam, which is predominantly the Iranian branch, that he will appear, are you ready for this, in the country of Iraq. You have Karbala and you have Samara, Iraq, and you have special mosques that are there. And it's believed that when the Mahdi comes, he will appear at this particular location, which means that according to Islam, the country of Iraq has to be in existence at the end of days. It also means that it has to be a very, very strong power at the end of days. It means that they have to be the premier nation in this part of the earth at the end of days. Because see, the first 42 months of the tribulation, you do not see the Antichrist in Jerusalem. When do you see him? You see him in the middle of the tribulation. Where is he the first 42 months? He has a headquarters. He has an army according to the scripture. And so he would have a place that he would rule. And according again to Islam, it would be one or two or possibly three different cities in the country of Iraq where he would come from. Now, are you ready for this? Listen carefully. Is this the reason why that this woman in the book of Zechariah is taken to the plains of Shinar and she is called the woman of wickedness? And a house is built for her there in the last days. Because Zechariah is prophesying about the last days. And maybe that's why when she's least, <clears throat> you have a woman riding the beast. Did you just get it? Why do you suddenly in the book of Revelation have a woman riding on a beast? And it's called Mystery Babylon. Because the actual Babylon used to be in Iraq. And when this woman is sealed in this basket, suddenly she is released and she is wickedness. And she is the personification of what John saw in the book of Revelation that rises into the earth, introducing false teaching and false religion and false ideas to merge different religions together that will not present the truth to people. Now, there's a link there. I'm not saying how deep that link goes because I really don't know. I do know this, that according to Islamic teaching, that the Mahdi is supposed to rule for 7, 9, or 19 years. Oh, now that's strange. You have a Daniel 9, 27 tribulation that lasts for how long? Seven years. And now you have Islam teaching the Mahdi will rule for that length of time. Now check this out. Iranian television in 2007, quote, After the 12th Imam's uprising from Mecca and all of Arabia, all of Arabia will submit to him than other parts of the world as he marches upon Iraq and establishes his seat of global government in the city of Kufa, Iraq. Then the Imam will send ten thousands of his forces to the east and west to uproot the oppressors. The, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran broadcasted the following. Before the Islamic Messiah appears to the world, a pious person, a venerable God-fearing individual from Iran meets the Mahdi. This individual will pledge allegiance to the Mahdi as he fights oppression and corruption and enters Iraq to... Um, 
to, to, lift, to lift the siege, lift the siege of Kufa and Holy Najaf and to defeat the forces of Islam's enemies in Iraq. Now these are predictions because the Americans being there, here's what you've got to understand. The American troops being in Iraq are a restraining force to these ideas coming to pass. So this